What is up you guys? So in this one we're going to talk about continuous time sinusoidal signals. That is, we're going to introduce what a cosine is and its related parameters that are the amplitude, phase, and frequency. We're going to give some of its main properties along with why negative frequencies appear in signal processing. We're going to explain negative frequencies through a concept really well known in electrical engineering that is called phasers. So without further ado, let's get started. Now the concept of frequency is familiar to students in engineering and the sciences. For example, from physics, we know that frequency is closely related to a specific type of periodic motion called harmonic oscillation which is described by sinusoidal functions. The concept of frequency is directly related to the concept of time. Actually, it has the dimension of inverse time. Therefore, we should expect that the nature of time, whether it is continuous or discrete, would definitely affect the nature of the frequency accordingly. In this lecture, we're going to talk about continuous time sinusoidal signals. You should always do the distinction between continuous and discrete time signals. In this lecture will focus on continuous time sinusoidal ones and then the next one we'll talk about discrete time sinusoidal signals. Now a simple harmonic oscillation is mathematically described by the following continuous time sinusoidal signal. So it's a signal in one dimension, x of t, that is written as follows. Now, as you would expect, the signal is analog. So I'm going to use a subscript A, A for analog, okay? This signal is completely characterized by three and only three parameters. A, omega, and theta. A is the amplitude of the sinusoid. Omega is the frequency in measured in radians per second, or for short, RAD for radian per second. And theta is the phase in radians. Instead of omega, we often use the frequency f in cycles per second or even hertz so instead of omega we can write down 2 pi f right where f is measured in hertz or cycles per second right in terms of f we can express this equation by replacing omega and hence you could find in many references that a single sinusoid is expressed in terms of f instead of omega. So in that case we'll have a cosine 2 pi f t plus theta, right? Now we're going to use both formulas interchangeably throughout this course and it's always good to associate a sinusoid with the following figure. Sorry about my drawing, but I'm not really that good at drawing, right? So, so over here, um, the amplitude is just, you know, the distance between the time axis, right? And the peak. So it's this guy over here. This is my amplitude. My period is measured between two identical points. It's the time taken to repeat a certain point. So let's say I pick my point to be the max or the peak, it's the time taken to repeat this peak. So it's the time between those two points over here. And hence my frequency f would be nothing other than the reciprocal of t, that is 1 over t, right? And last but not least, the phase is how much this peak has shifted from the origin, right? So this point right here 
is actually a cosine theta, right? Because at t equal to zero, we've got a cosine theta, right? And so you should always keep this figure in mind when thinking about sinusoids. Um, so from this analog definition that we have, we can draw some important properties. The first one being about its period. So property one tells us that if you take your signal XA and look at any time T plus the period, it's the same as looking at this particular instance. That is T, right? You can easily prove that using basic mathematics. So all you need to do is plug in t plus t in the formula and use the fact that f times uppercase t is 1. And then you'd use again that cosine x plus 2 pi is the same as cosine x, right? And that's it. So this is property 1 that has to deal with the period. Property 2 tells us that if I take a look at two continuous time sinusoidal signals of this form or this form, but with different frequencies, then we're basically looking at different signals. Let me show you what I mean. If I go over to MATLAB and I input a signal with amplitude one, and let's say a frequency of 50, right? With phase shift of zero, that's X1. And x2, I'll look at the same signal, but this time with frequency 10, right? If I go ahead and plot x1, it looks like this. Um, and if I go ahead and look at x2, it will look like this, the red curve. If I zoom in on some window over here, you can see that the signals are themselves different. Now, you might be wondering, oh, why is it here decaying? That's not a cosine. What's going on? Well, that's because my sampling rate is not correct. For that, we'll need a correct sampling rate. We didn't talk about the choices of sampling rates and so on, right? Um, we'll leave that to future lectures, but for now, I'm just going to change my frequency. Let's say I have a frequency of five and x2 is a frequency of 10. I'm going to close my figure, open another one, and then I'll do the same plotting again. So this looks better, right? It's not destructed as the one before. And I'll plot x2 over it and there you go. So if we zoom in on some window, we can see that both signals are different. Why is that? It's because they've got two different frequencies, right? So this is property two, telling us that two sinusoids with different frequencies are different. And the last property I'd like to talk about, property three, if you increase the frequency, then so does the rate of oscillation. Increasing frequency increases with it the rate of oscillation of the signal. And here's an example, as we saw, X1, the blue plot, is a sinusoid with frequency 5 hertz, whereas the red sinusoid has frequency 10 hertz. And as you can see, the one with the red sinusoid oscillates higher, has a higher rate of oscillation than that of the blue sinusoid. Now, one thing to observe here is that what if I had a signal with frequency 0, right? Let's say I've got a signal X, X3 that is a sinusoid of frequency zero. Well, what happens in that case? Um, if I open a new figure, and plot it over here, there you go, it's just a horizontal line at one. The definition of a sinusoid is still reserved, right? It's a signal with amplitude one, phase shift zero, it's not shifted, it peaks at one, and the period is infinity. So it needs an infinite amount of time to repeat itself which is consistent with the definition f equal one over t. Now, due to continuity of the time variable t, we can increase the frequency without any limit, which would thus lead to an increase of oscillation rate as we discussed in property three. Now with sinusoids, we can always associate complex exponential 
signals. So over here, I could go ahead and say, I can define an X A if T, that is A, but instead of my cosine or sine, I'll say exponential J omega T plus theta, right? This can easily be seen by expressing these signals in terms of sinusoids using Euler's identity. So using Euler, I could write down X A of T as A cosine omega T plus theta plus J A sine that same amount omega T plus theta and I'm writing between my properties which is not good and there you go so by definition frequency is an inherently positive physical quantity so the omega that you see over here by definition because it counts the number of cycles per second right 2 pi f where f counts the number of cycles per second so we cannot you know have a negative by definition we cannot say that we have minus 10 cycles per second right however in many cases only for mathematical convenience we need to introduce negative frequencies to see this we could express also using I'm going to use the formula that says cosine x is half ejx plus half e plus its conjugate, half e minus jx, okay? This is easily derived from Euler's identity. Apply Euler's identity on the negative complex exponential, then add both equations up. Okay, so over here, we can see that by adding two equal amplitude complex conjugate exponential signals, if I go ahead and say over here, I've got an a cosine x, right? Right over here, I've got an A, multiplied by A on all sides, right? Um, then we get a sinusoid upon adding two complex conjugate exponential signals. This is really important when talking about something called phasers. So I found this code on the web by a guy called Eric, and he's got some open source MATLAB code that plots phasers. And I just want to show you how phasers work. So let's say we've got two cosines, right? That are, you know, in opposite phases. That is one cosine is in phase zero and the other one is at phase 180, right? This is how their phasor diagram would look like. Let's say there's another phase between them. So let's say one is at 90 degrees and the other is zero. This is where you, this is what you have. So when a phaser is rotating on the unit circle or on a circle of radius defined by the magnitude of the cosine, let's set it to one just to have a unit circle. There you go. You can see that when this phaser arrow rotates, we can go ahead and plot the cosine at different phases defined by the angles. And what is going on over here is that once I replace my X with what I have, omega t plus theta, then my a cosine omega t plus theta is actually generated using those two phasors that you see over here. That are two exponential signals. So each exponential signal is an arrow or a phasor in the complex domain. So where my x-axis is, is the real axis and my y is the imaginary axis. So this guy over here has an angle defined by the exponent of this complex exponential, that is omega t plus theta. And this guy is minus omega t plus theta. So we're going to go clockwise. So the magnitude of this thing is also omega t plus theta, right? And the measure or the magnitude of the arrow is a over two. The phasor measures a over two. So the circle is at a over two. And so, once those phasors rotate at the frequency of omega, then you're actually plotting your cosine, the one you have over here, right? The, the green curve, okay? So it's always important to know why negative frequencies occur in practice. So as I vary T, and thus those two phasors rotate in opposite directions, right? 
with angular frequency omega, the first one having an angular frequency of plus omega, the second phaser having an angular frequency of minus omega due to the clockwise direction, then we can plot the cosine function we have over here, right? Now, so since a positive frequency corresponds to a counterclockwise direction, a negative frequency simply just corresponds to a clockwise direction. So for mathematical convenience, we're going to use both negative and positive frequencies throughout this course. So my variable or parameter f takes any value between minus infinity and plus infinity. Okay. So that's it for this lecture. I hope it was beneficial. I hope you caught up something or had a doubt that you got clear doubt. We talked about continuous time sinusoidal signals. That is, we introduced what a sinusoidal signal looks like in terms of its three main parameters that are the amplitude, frequency, and phase. We gave three of its main properties as well as a complex representation of sinusoidal signals. You should always have an association between sinusoids and complex exponentials. We introduced negative frequencies, what they mean, even though, you know, implicitly it doesn't make any sense because frequency counts the number of cycles per second. So you can't just have, you know, a negative number of cycles per second. However, when you attach the idea of cosines with complex exponentials, then your cosine is nothing other than a sum of two complex conjugate exponential signals, each of amplitude a over two, right? And thus, when generating this cosine function or this cosine wave, it is actually the equivalent of two phasers rotating in opposite directions. These two phasers have the same magnitude, A over two, thanks to the two complex conjugate equimagnitude signals and the same angular frequency, omega, but one rotating counterclockwise and the other one rotating in a clockwise direction, right? And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about discrete time sinusoidal signals. That is, instead of the independent variable t that we have here, we're going to replace it by an integer variable n, which is usually referred to as the sample number. Thanks for watching. If you found this lecture beneficial, please leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions whatsoever, Kindly leave a comment down in the comment section below and I'll make sure I'll get to it as soon as possible. Also consider donating to my Patreon account any amount that you wish starting from $3 because that's the minimum Patreon <laughs> allows me. Okay, so thanks for watching and I'll see you in future lectures.